Welcome to the midweek devotion from the United Methodist Church in Littleton, Illinois. If you joined us last week, you might remember that we found this tiny little hole in the ground that we thought might be a den, and we promised this week we'd show you what lived in that tiny little hole in the ground. It looks like we're not alone in our quest. This doe, it looks like she's staking out the hole in the ground and falling asleep while waiting on something to emerge. And this, this raccoon comes over to check out and see who this is that fell asleep on her front yard. As morning dawns, it looks like the whole family has come home from a night of carousing to curl up in the den and sleep it off. I would never have guessed that a whole family of raccoons would live in that little hole in the ground. There is a, an important Christian holiday. It's the day of Pentecost, the day that um, the disciples waited for. They were told when Jesus ascended back into heaven that they should wait until the Holy Spirit came upon them and gave them power to be witnesses in um, all the world. And that date happened on Pentecost. It's the official birthday of the church. It's not possible for me to overstate the importance of the church to my life. The church is the bride of Christ. The church is entrusted with God's message of salvation and grace to, to this world. The church is the salt of God in this world today. When vaunting the praises of God's church, Christ's church, I have to be a little bit honest here and say, the church is not flawless. Someday it will be, today it is not. It's full of people. People are flawed. The church carries those flaws. There are times when the church has hurt. There are times the church has been less than it should be. There have been times when the church has not been on the ball where it should be. There are times, do you suppose God face palms? If he does, I imagine he has face palmed over the church many, many times over the years. But you know what? My family is not perfect either. I mean, my family is so not perfect that we have all these family stories and jokes we could tell about it. And, and we wouldn't want other people to say about it. But, you know, among ourselves, we, we know. I live in a wonderful small town that I, I'm still in the same town I grew up in. I was born in this town. I was raised in this town. I, I moved away and I came back. I'm retired now, or semi-retired, but I've been on different boards and committees in our uh, uh, civic boards and committees in our town. I've been in civic clubs in our town. I, I know many of the leaders, and we have a we have a school board, and we have a you know city council, and we have a hospital board, and we have a board of mental health, and we have we have a lot of boards, and we have a lot of clubs. Uh, I've been a part of Rotary for for years, and. You know what? They are not flawless. I mean, 
they are so not flawless. And if you come from my town, you know what I mean. But it's still important to me. It's a, a place I love. And I think the church may be kind of like that. As we come to Pentecost 2023, and we are um, celebrating once again the birth of the church and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit upon the church, I think we find the church in decline and wrestling with one of the most difficult times that the church has gone through in my particular lifetime. And it, it sort of hurts my heart to watch that. And I think it probably must also pull at the heart of God to watch his church, his pride, that he poured his life out for, struggling at a time like this. Three aspects of this decline that I, I think are worthy of mentioning on this Pentecost weekend. Now, everything I say on these Wednesdays, I, I say to make us think and challenge us and to wrestle with an idea, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm right. So if you disagree with me, that is fine. As long as you know why you disagree and you think about it and think through it, because I'm often wrong and I'm no, no genius. Uh, and no great theologian. So um, here's the first I want to say. I think a lot of it we bring upon ourselves. The criticisms that the church is too much in bed with politics, or that we are too much a church of culture and not a church of Christ, or that we major on minor things and we minor on the major things, and that we have neglected where we should be as salt and light of Christ on this planet. And, and I think all of those statements are, um, are true and that we as a church need to get our act together. Number two, we are living in a time of cultural revolution. Now, we talked about this some on Sunday as we were uh, preaching and looking through First Peter. And there was a time of, of revolution then too, and, and Christianity was not compatible with the Roman religions. It, it was a change, and it became an enemy, an illegal religion. We looked on Sunday at different cultures through the years. We looked at Chairman Mao and the cultural revolution in, um, in China and the way that Confucius, which once was front and center, got pushed back to, I don't know, maybe public enemy number one or something. And, and we realized that when there's a whole revolution coming, there is a whole new morality, there is a whole new system, there's a whole new view of right and wrong based on a different premise, a different foundation, however shaky that foundation might be. And the two, the, <coughs> the old and the new, don't usually blend so well as one surplants the other. And there is a cultural revolution happening now <coughs> to where there is a, a new morality that isn't compatible <coughs> with the old morality. I, sw I swallowed a gnat. <laughs> and that the new morality even sees the old morality as an enemy. And so that there are, are more and more uh, people today not only that see Christianity as being out of touch or out of date, or see it as superstitious, but they actually see it as the enemy, as evil, as uh, something that should not be tolerated, <coughs> or at least kept confined. And you may agree, you may disagree. What do you think? Are, <coughs> is the traditional um, morality being replaced by a new morality? And if so, Will people that hang on to the traditional morality be seen as enemies of those that are newer and more enlightened? Okay, let's go to a third part, um, the third one, which I think probably is the most troubling to me right now and, and causes the most 
ache in my soul. And that is a, a fear or a worry that many of Christ's younger Christian soldiers, a part of the church that's right on the, on the moving edge of the church, may have bought into or be buying into a new morality and a new culture that's supplanting the church of Jesus Christ without even necessarily knowing it. I mean, let's, let's face it. We've already said the church has its own share of troubles. And it's not perfect. And it needs a revival. And if the church is going to be revived, is it going to come through people from my age? People that are not going to be with us that much longer, who are retired and, and in the final years of their lives? I mean, God can do anything God wants, but that's not usually where revivals take place. Engaged, excited, energized, a younger generation that takes the baton out of the hand of us older ones and runs the race with all they have, that is where the Holy Spirit often works. And my fear is that many of those younger possibly, you know, people that will run the this leg of the relay coming after us, that they have so bought in to the new culture that they also see the church as an enemy without realizing they are the church. Well, you may agree, you uh, may not agree, but these are just thoughts that I'm kind of wrestling with. I, I won't say they're all nailed down in my brain, but I'm kind of wrestling with them on this particular, um, this particular Pentecost weekend. Well, it's Wednesday. We're halfway through this week. I'm through pretty much with ideas to challenge us for this week. And in a few days, we get to come together on Pentecost Sunday and worship our Lord together. And I'm looking forward to it. Now, before I let you go, I've previewed a little bit of what I just said, and there are a couple of things I think I need to clear up so we don't make a mistake with what I'm trying to say. The first is, I do not think that the next generation of God's moving is going to come through a particular political party or political slant. That is, I'm not trying to call and mobilize a lot of people to be become political, but rather to become servants of Jesus Christ, healing and comforting and bringing wholeness to a culture that's broken. Now, that's not a political thing. That is a spirit-led heart thing. And the second thing I think that I need to bring to your attention uh, that I might have come across is sometimes when a person gets up here and they speak about a point, they get a little carried away. And, and it may sound like gloom and doom and the end of the church. And the, I do not believe that at all. I believe that the church is not of human origin. It's of divine origin. And in some way, fashion or the other, through all the hard times and all of the good times and all of the centuries that are difficult and the centuries that are prosperous, that when Christ comes back again for his church, he will find his church serving him and victorious. I think at the end of the book, the church doesn't lose and Christ will take care of his church. So, God bless you and watch over you and encourage you and challenge you and, and make you think about um, the way we as a church can be better at serving our Lord.